Hi, my name is Mike Gaben, and welcome to episode 32 of my beta campaign. As you may recall from last episode, the Huygens, my nuclear-powered shuttle, was on its way to the moon to recover Tom Plock and Genimal, who are in the Canada station, which is in orbit about the moon. But unfortunately, our rescuers were left with a bit of a problem when the nuclear generator uh, w went into forced shutdown mode due to overheating, leaving the uh, vessel with minimal power, certainly not enough to get back home. So we ended that episode with me trying to figure out what it was that I was going to do to now get these four Kerbonauts that are stuck in lunar orbit back home. And my first instinct was to actually get all of them into one place. There is tons of life support ab aboard the Kanata station, uh, but minimal life support aboard the Huygens. So I took Tom Plock and put them into the lander that is connected to the Kanata station, uh, the lander's name being the Tycho, and his job was to go and recover uh, the crew from the Huygens. Now the lander, unfortunately, can only hold two crews. So with the pilot, that means that Tom Plock is going to have to make two trips to recover the uh, the crew of the Huygens. But you know what? This gives me an opportunity to talk a little bit about orbital transfers once again. You know, I've talked about orbital transfers in previous episodes, but they've always been nice circular orbits. I've transferred from a lower orbit to a higher orbit or a higher orbit to a lower orbit. I even transferred between two points that were in roughly the same orbit, but I've never had this situation where I had to transfer between a nice circular orbit that you see here in blue to this very eccentric orbit of the Huygens that you see in yellow. Now the easiest place to do the transfer burn is from the point in the low, in the circular orbit that matches up with the periapsis of the eccentric orbit. And the reason for that is because the uh, ship in that eccentric orbit will be moving much slower out in, as it's towards its apoapsis as opposed to where it's close to its periapsis. So this gives you a lot more flexibility as to you know, uh, to, f to find that close encounter and where it's going to occur. So you simply burn until you see where you're going to get some encounter nodes close together, and then it's the normal practice of playing around with the prograde, uh, perhaps doing a little bit of normal adjustments, uh, if in this case the two orbits are very close to being in the same plane, so I don't need to do much in the way of normal adjustments. If you had to make a large normal adjustment, then things get uh, much more complicated and as you can see here I'm getting my encounter fairly easily so uh, we end up moving away from the space station so that we can perform our burn and of course uh, two or three minutes before we get to our closest encounter we we switch our nav ball over to target mode and start to burn to match velocities because our orbits are so different that the uh, the approach velocity is going to be quite a bit higher than what you've been seeing for most of my rendezvous but for the most part it works exactly the same way as it did before so I'm gonna cut to the chase and get in nice and close now the one thing I don't want to do is I don't want to dock the Tycho with the um, with the Huygens. The Huygens has overheating issues right now. There's a lot of heat built into that and you can't control heat. You can't transfer it in the same way as you can other resources or waste products. You can't pump it around. So if I dock the two together, that heat's going to start transferring to the Tyco and the last thing I want is for the Tyco to start having overheating problems as well. So I'm simply going to park it nearby and uh, we'll pick Lunny, you know, uh, Robble was the commander, so she will stick with the ship, and Lunny will fly on over again into the Tycho, and then it's time to get on back. Now, the way to get back is we're now in a very eccentric orbit, and so the best place for us to perform our burn would be at periaps. So we wait till we get to periapsis, and while we're waiting, Robble decides that she might as well use the time to try and uh, make this orbit less eccentric so that the next rendezvous will be a little bit easier. So she fires up the engines of the Huygens at full thrust and even at this tiny little fraction of a G. Uh, you know, after three minutes of burning, she gets that orbit down to something that is, well, it's, it's going to be better anyway. And then we switch on over to the Tycho and perform 
our rendezvous with the Kanata station. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't have the record button pushed when I set up this particular rendezvous, but it's the same as before. The key is doing it at the right location, which is periapsis, and then you're just going to burn retrograde until you get some maneuver nodes where you like them to be. Um, and, you know, this works actually the same way as if you're going from an eccentric orbit into a circular orbit as it would have as if I was coming from a hyperbolic trajectory into a rendezvous with something in a circular orbit. And, in fact, that exact thing did happen the first time that uh, Tom Plock and Gentleman came to the Canada station. That happened a few episodes ago, and I'll put a link down so you can, uh, you can see that one uh, if you want to see what's going on with that. But, uh, you know... Rendezvous went per normal again. I'm not even going to bother dock. I want to just get right back out there. So uh, I just didn't even dock. I just flew Lenny over to the Kanata station. And then Tom Plock, again, setting up um, that maneuver near where the eccentric orbits periapsis is. Same process as before. And this time it's time to go get Robble. And Robble makes her last job to make sure lights are all off and come on aboard. And so uh, now we got all four of them aboard the uh, Kanata station. Uh, and then I can start to think, it's, it's kind of obvious here. I don't quite have my A team. I don't think, I don't know why they're so upset. But anyway, uh, now it's time to start thinking about how am I going to get these four people back home? And while the residents of Kanata Station continue to scream at each other senselessly, the decision came from Mission Control that a new Huygens would be built. And as the only pilot left on the ground, it would be Jeb that would be flying up to rescue the four of them. Well, these guys would have none of that. And they convinced Mission Control that if they could get the Huygens that is in orbit around the moon working again, that they can attempt to fly that back to Kerbin and rescue themselves. So, Tom Plock and Robble elected to be the ones to get back into the Tycho and fly back out into the Huygens. Then, once at the Huygens, they would wait for the reactor to cool down and then attempt to manually restart it. Uh, now, you might recall towards the end of last episode, I opened up this reactor system interface window that's part of the interstellar mod, and it told me that there was a current lifetime for the reactor of 0.39 days, and I sort of guessed that perhaps this has to do with how, much, how long it's going to take for it to cool down. Well, I was wrong, actually. That 0.39 days is nowhere near what it takes for the reactor to cool down. Um, it's just measuring the rate at which the uranium is being used up and giving you an estimate on when it's going to run out. And with the reactor shut down, that rate was all messed up, and that number really didn't mean anything at all. What you have to do is you have to wait for the decay heating. That is the heating that's caused by the, the uh, fission byproducts to radioactively decay. you got to wait for that to get down to zero. Then, once that's down to zero, you got to wait for the waste heat to get down to zero. And that took little over 16 days. So, thankfully, I ended up taking quite a bit of life support from the Hipparchus station in the Tycho all the way all out here. So, these guys were fine as far as life support, but they had a very boring 16 days to spin around the moon. But then, once those 16 days were up, the reactor sh was able to fire up, and this thing was at full power. So, here's the plan. The plan is to get this back to the Kanata station, um, and then to pick up, obviously, uh, the other two Kerbals that we have there, and uh, to get back into Kerbin. And then what I wanted to do was to shut down the reactor once I finished the transfer burn to get to Kerbin, and then hopefully with a controlled shutdown, it wouldn't take nearly so long for it to uh, fire up again. I also thought it would be prudent to take the Tycho along as kind of a lifeboat, Although it would be a lifeboat that can only hold half the crew, but that's better than nothing. Um, and also, it has a chemical engine on it, and it can be used as a backup, because I do have some liquid fuel uh, and oxidizer still left. But, well, a couple of hiccups happened along the way with that. Hiccup number one was that... Uh, as I was performing my rendezvous to get back to the Kanata station, I noticed as I was approaching the Kanata station, that, boy, my, my Delta V is really, really low. There's no way it should be that low. And I noticed that uh, the engine, the nuclear thermal engine, was on 
liquid fuel in oxidizer mode, which means it wasn't burning it. It was using it as propellant and chucking it out the back wastefully. Uh, so, oh no, I didn't have it on water mode. So it wasn't using the water that is supposed to be the propellant of this thing. And when I went and checked, it used up almost all the liquid fuel that I had. So I only had a little bit of liquid fuel and oxidizer left. But I thought I would cross that bridge later. For now, I just wanted to dock these two vessels with the Kanata station. So we separate here and I, I'm going to bring in the uh, the Huygens in first. Um, now one of the things I wanted to do because I had this idea of you know that I'm going to do the burn, the transfer burn to Kerbin and then shut the reactor down and then hopefully I'll be able to refire the reactor back up again when I needed it to circularize around Kerbin. But uh, I have no idea, I mean I know now that it takes a long time if I have a force shutdown to restart the reactor, but I have no idea how long it takes if I do a control shutdown. So I thought it would be best to test that out. So I ended up doing a control shutdown of this reactor just to test how long it would take before I can restart it again. And that introduced hiccup number two. It takes you got to pretty much go through the same process as I'll show you later. So we end up spending quite a bit more time aboard the Hipparchus or the Kanata station than uh, I otherwise would have liked. But uh, there's worse places to be. Again, plenty of life support. That's not going to be an issue. All we have to do is wait it out. And once everything was docked with the Kanata station. There were a few things I wanted to do in, in preparation before I make my attempt to get these, these folks back home. Uh, number one is I sent out Lunny to check on the reactor to see if it, maybe it would just fire right back up again. Uh, I wasn't surprised to find out that that doesn't work that way. I mean, that makes sense. You know, you can't just flip these things on and off like a lamp. But, uh, you know, I thought it was worth at least checking. Uh... Then uh, I realized that, okay, I'm going to have to start radiating away some of these heats. So I, I shut down the uh, gigantors that are on the station um, because those solar panels do generate some heat, not nearly as much as the reactor, but every little bit is going to help. And then I realized as well that, you know, once the decay heating is done, electricity is going to be an issue. So uh, these vessels might end up becoming separated once again down the road. So I took one of the solar panels from the Tyco and moved it over to the Huygens so that uh, both vessels now are able to generate electrical power independent of the, uh, the uh, nuclear reactor. And then finally I took whatever liquid fuel and oxidizer I had left and transferred it over to the Tyco. And I sat there looking at this and I go, you know, what I'm going to need this potentially for is to do my circularization, circularization burn around Kerbin. And I think, I think what I see here is going to be enough, but it feels close. And you know, there is a place where I have pretty much as much fuel as I might need. Now, there's no way for me to get these guys down to that fuel, but perhaps there's a way to get the fuel up to here. Not far from the Kanata station at all is my abandoned, though still completely functional, moon base. And that includes this cathane, or carbonite, <laughs> refinery, not cathane, carbonite, uh, capable of extracting carbonite from the moon's crust and refining that into liquid fuel and oxidizer. And it can generate more than enough fuel to for, for our needs and it is an autonomous craft it has a pro body it has its own power generation as an engine there on the bottom the only problem is it is rather firmly connected to the rest of the base through these KAS fuel pipes but really like how strong can these fuel pipes be well as it turns out pretty freaking strong. My hope was that actually the pipe would snap off, but as you can see here, that's not going to happen. And despite my efforts, I think at this point, the uh, conclusion of this experiment is inevitable.
least I hope you enjoyed the light show. But it is pretty clear that the folks aboard the Canada station are going to have to deal with the resources that they have. Uh, but in the meantime, Jeb has gone entirely too long without flying anything. So here we have him aboard the Kayam 2 on his way to the Haparka station, which is in low Kerbin orbit. And as you can see, along for the ride is Bill 2, because he needs something to do. Um, and the mission is to rendezvous with the space station and uh, sort of lighten the load there. There are four Kerbals in that particular space station, and I want to start getting some of them back down to the surface. Um, I want to leave a couple of them up there, so I'm going to leave Manuki up there and Ruben up there, because... Um, you know, we do have the Huygens coming in, and I'm not entirely sure exactly what's going to happen. So I think having uh, a vehicle ready, fueled, and in orbit uh, might not be a bad idea. They might end up being necessary for a rescue mission. But uh, there's no reason for all of these folks to stay up here. So Tedass and Bob are going to be coming back down. Now, as the Kayam 2 undocks from the space station, you may recall from previous episodes that I've had some adventures with this docking port on this particular vessel and infernal robotics and small parts trying to connect those things together. Not exactly, I've never been able to quite get the, the uh, problem sorted out, but I tried something else with this one. I decided I would use Oscar B fuel tanks, those little small fuel tanks, drain the fuel out of them so they're, they're not a lot of mass and, and so I'm using them kind of as structural pieces. Uh, to connect the infernal robotics parts, pistons, with the docking port and see if that's going to help. And as you can see here, no, it's still kind of glitched. So this docking port, once again, won't go down. Uh, you know, this is going to have to obviously be a problem that's going to have to uh, not get fixed <laughs> in this particular campaign. I'm too close to the end of it. I'll have to deal with it in some future shuttle or in some future shuttle in some future campaign. I officially given up on this now, but anyway, the descent and landing went without issue, so I think it's time to revisit our folks that are in orbit around the moon. And at the moon, we are busy time warping, waiting for that thermal nuclear reactor to uh, cool on down. Um, yeah, and this is going to take a while because I'm only in about a 50 kilometer orbit, uh, so I ended up just letting this go while I surfed G Plus and watched YouTube videos and stuff. And uh, yeah, I also found out that if you leave the, the vessel, if you don't have the vessel as the target vessel, that the uh, heat does not go down at all, so you have to stick with it. Uh, and this took a while, and after 14 days, this time it was actually the thermal power that hit zero before the waste heat hit zero and I guess it's either of them hitting zero because once that thermal power got down to zero I was able to go down there and see that I can now restart the reactor but I didn't want to do it just yet because there are a few things I need to do first number one was to transfer all the resources that I think I might need aboard the Huygens and aboard the Tyco um, I want to transfer as much life support as I can because I don't know how well this is going to go. And then it comes time to separate the two vessels uh, join and dock the two together, transfer everybody aboard the Huygens, um, and then it was time to fire up this nuclear reactor so that we can get on out of here. The transfer from Lunar orbit to Kerbin, of course, is pretty standard fare. You want to burn so that your trajectory goes against the direction of the moon's orbit around Kerbin, uh, and then just fire her up. Uh, you can see here that now that the reactor is at full power, I am accelerating at 12 meters per second squared, over 12 meters per second squared, which is well over a G. So it's nice to have this vessel up and operational at least for a short time. It's too bad that the flame effects and the sound effects are pretty much the same regardless of the power level, so this thing sounds the same as it did when it was running at some tiny fraction of its full power. And of course we burn until our periapsis is down into Kerbin's atmosphere so that we can take advantage of some arrow breaking um, to, to get ourselves into low Kerbin orbit. I'm going to hold off on shutting down the reactor until 
the last possible moment um, because I want to maximize the amount of decay heating. I'm not going to do emerge let it do an emergency shutdown, but I want that decay heating to be as as high as possible. And that percentage after the decay heating, by the way, indicates the percentage of full power that is available. So the more decay heating I have, the more power I have available from uh, from that heating, and the better my thrust, how pitiful it'll be, every little bit is going to count. I'm going to be using the trajectories mod to help me tweak my arrow braking maneuver. I want to keep the max G forces under about half a G. Um, I got to be a little bit careful because this is a pretty massive vessel. It's I probably, it is my most massive vessel I've built. And more, the more massive a vessel, the less it will decelerate as it goes through the atmosphere, which means the more heat it will end up generating. So, you know, you can go in there with a small vessel and, uh, an arrow break pretty aggressively, but with a big vessel, you're going to have to be a little bit more careful. So here we are, so close to home, but by no means out of the woods yet. So we have to begin our preparations for our arrow breaking maneuver. Uh, I start off by closing the shutters on the crew can. Uh, I, I, I know that that's not necessary, but I think it's good for effect. And of course, we're going to retract all of these radiators because these would probably get broken off pretty much for sure. Uh, I do have everybody in the Huygens because, you know, in case I lose like attitude control or something like that, I might end up losing the Tyco. Who knows? So I think it's safer to have everybody together in one vessel. Um, by this time, of course, the reactor has been shut down, and I'm only working on about 6% power, but I thought, you know, I uh, might as well use it, so I fire up the engine to try and bring down this orbit as much as I can using both the engine and the atmosphere. Again, I got tons of Delta V on this thing, so that is by no means going to be a problem. Though what could end up being a problem is heat. I'm watching the temperature on that engine. I'm not exactly sure at what temperature this engine might begin to threaten to explode, but I thought keeping it under 1500 degrees C would probably be a prudent thing to do. So I'm keeping an eye on the temperature, and as it gets closer to 1500, I'll just throttle down and let it cool off for a little while before I fire off, fire up that engine again. The other thing that I'm taking a look at is my time to periapsis because when I pass periapsis that means I am past the lowest part, the densest part of the atmosphere and I'm on my way up and that means that the worst of this thing is over. So pushing in 10 seconds to periapsis. Taking a look at my orbit as well. Seven seconds to periapsis five seconds. This thing is holding to that retrograde vector just perfectly. Three seconds, two seconds, one second, and now I'm on my way up. Uh, and uh, fire up that engine again, try and see if I can uh, again reduce that apoapsis as much as I can. But uh, yeah, this is actually going really, really well. My G-forces are being kept under control. I'm only in around a half a G, which is exactly about what was predicted by, um, by the trajectories mod. And yeah, the worst of this is over, and it's uh, only uphill from here. And once outside of Kerbin's atmosphere, I decide I'm going to do another arrow breaking pass and lower my orbit even further so I warp my way out to apoapsis and burn a little bit prograde to raise my periapsis because uh, trajectories is predicting me to actually impact Kerbin which I don't want to do but uh, still using the decay heating in the nuclear engine I'm able to uh, raise my periapsis enough to get myself a nice predicted trajectory once again, once I come out of Kerbin's atmosphere, so we do another pass through the atmosphere, again, without really any incidences whatsoever. It just tracks perfectly, and I get no heating problems at all. But of course, 
the arrow breaking was never my biggest concern with this vessel. My biggest concern with this vessel is, will I be able to raise my periapsis out of the atmosphere at the end of all this and achieve a stable orbit with only either the marginal nuclear power that I have or the minuscule amount of liquid fuel and oxidizer that I have left. Because if I can't, then this thing is destined just to crash into the atmosphere and crash into Kerbin, and I will have a very limited amount of time to use the Kuryu's, which is the vessel that's attached to the Hipparchus station in Kerbin orbit, to try and get these people off. The Kuryu's can only hold three, three people, and there's four people on this vessel. Yeah, things will get dicey if I can't raise that periapsis. So, after coming out of Kerbin's atmosphere once again, and after a little bit of time warping, the time of truth has arrived. And two minutes before apoapsis, we start our burn. You can see here we're generating a mighty 0 .0, or wait, 0 0.34 meters per second squared of acceleration. Again, a tiny fraction of a G. Do remember, I do have the Tycho's engine as a backup engine. Um, but it has a limited amount of fuel, so I would like to get as much out of the nuclear engine as I can. But, as it turns out, after just a little bit over a minute of burning, the periapsis comes out of the atmosphere. Yes, that's a relief. We are now in a stable orbit, and you got to know there's some cheering going on in the, uh, in the Huygens right now. But I figure, you know what, might as well make this as nice an orbit as I can, so I just keep on burning. And after another four and a half minutes, I get my eccentricity down to 0 0.013 and my inclination at 0 0.026. Yeah, this is going to be a nice, easy target for the Kayam to come up here and pick up all of these guys. So you got to know there is a lot of relief going on and a lot of high fives all around. Uh, yeah, these guys are pretty much home free. You know, it really does go to show that once you're out in space, Rust is really not that big a deal, and you can accomplish quite a lot with a limited amount of thrust. Now, of course, we waste absolutely no time launching the Kayam 2 with Jeb and Robert at the helm. Uh, yeah, this is going to be a pretty happy mission for them and a pretty routine rendezvous. Yeah, there's, there's no issues with this whatsoever. The only thing I'm not going to do is I'm not going to do a docking with the Kayam. One of the big reasons, of course, being that my docking port with the Kayam, I'm, I've given up on it. I'm not going to bother with it. And also, of course, there isn't a free docking port on the Huygens slash Tyco. I'd have to take these apart to dock, so what's the point of that? Instead, what I'm just going to do is park up alongside and fly my Kerbals over. And, uh, Gentleman is the first one to make the trip, and oh, isn't that a beautiful sight? And you got to know for her, that might be one of the most gorgeous things that she has ever seen. And the last to fly over was the Huygens pilot Robble. And you would think, after expertly navigating the, the uh, hobbled Huygens back home, that doing this simple EVA would be no problem whatsoever, but... Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't quite turn out that way. Oh, what a wonderful way to end this particular mission. So, we, yeah, so, well, you know, Robble ends up d getting back into the Kayam uh, while deking out this swarm of solar panels that somehow seem to be hanging around the Kayam like moss. I'm not quite sure what's going on with that, but after that little bit of an instant, yeah, the descent went without it, without issue. Get these four back, actually six now, back onto the ground. And then there were two. Yes, only two people left in the space station. And it is the Kuryus which brought the first crew to the Hipparchus station that will ferry Manuki and Ruben back down to Kerbin. But, you know, after following uh, the return of the Huygens, Manuki and Ruben feel sort of compelled to at least attempt to match that drama. Now, way back in episode 3, Manuki broke an endurance record of two days in 
by herself in low carbon orbit. And during that time, she passed the time by watching some movies. And there was this one movie, I mean, maybe she was getting a little bit space happy, but there's this one movie that she swears she saw. She doesn't know where she pulled it in from, and she couldn't understand it. They were speaking in some language that was was way too slow and really felt like it was going backwards. Um, but it, it, she's pretty sure it was a documentary. At least at the very least, it looked real. And they had a very interesting maneuver when it came to returning uh, from a space station. And she shared her observations with her doubting uh, fellow Kerbinauts. And over the days, this maneuver has been come to be known as the Sandra Bullock maneuver. And it seems an essential component of this particular maneuver is to remain docked with the station as long as feasible, as long as possible, just remain docked and see how things go. So that's the name of this game. How long will I dare to remain docked with this particular space station? Now, I've just sped this up to two times speed, and if you notice that fuel tank down there on the bottom, uh, yeah, that was some deliberate asymmetry I put in there, and uh, now that the air is starting to get a little bit thicker, it's really starting to kick in here, swinging this thing back and forth, and I really don't have any control over it at all. I'm trying to keep going in. Um, I guess what I would consider a pro-grade direction, pro -grade direction, but there's there's just no way it wants to do that. Now the air is just pushing on that that one big fuel tank on the side, and I'm starting to get a little bit worried that um, I won't be able to click on the docking port to be able to undock this. So um, I'm I'm starting to get a little bit nervous at this point. Oh, so I ditched the uh, service module so I can get that out of the way. And oh, that was that was a train. I, was, <laughs> I gotta get off of this thing. Come on, dig it. Oh, shoot! Push the wrong button. I'm trying to put the camera into chase mode so it'll be easier to uh, click on that docking port. There we go. Come on, undock. Where's the? I'm getting the wrong one. I'm not getting the undock option. There it is. Undock. Undock. Whew. Okay, there we go. We're free. We're clear. All right. Oh. oh, that was interesting. Well, goodbye, space station. <laughs> anyway, um, so as Ruben and Manuki make their way down to safety, there's not much more that's going to be happening. So this is really drawing this episode to a close, but not this particular series. Um, I still have, I think, one episode left because I have a number of interplanetary missions still on the go. I got two of which are landers, so that's going to be interesting with remote tech. Um, got two on their way to Moho, one on its way to Duna, and one on its way to Drez. So as Ruben and Manuki get ready to splash down, thus putting all of my Kerbals safely back on Kerbin, uh, I hope that you will be you will come in for one more episode to help me or er, to watch me finish off these missions. Hope to see you then.